these documents and products will never be used by you because you'll be dead, unfortunately, but your loved ones will use them. And so that's, we believe, legacy. That's something you're going to leave behind. And if once you go down the legacy route, it gets quite exciting um, because it doesn't just have to be the will. It can be the voice notes and, and videos. I mean, some of the most valuable stuff I've got of my mum is little snippets on, on, on my phone or videos of her. Welcome to Tech Talks, hosted by myself, David Savage, and powered by Nash Squared. On today's show, I'm talking to Sam Grice, the CEO and founder of Octopus Legacy. And we're not meaning legacy in terms of technology legacy this time, we're meaning actual legacy, the stuff that people who sadly pass on and leave our lives leave behind and their memories and what we can do and how technology can make them make them have meaning in a very constructive and positive way we don't deal with death we don't really talk about death and so this podcast is dealing with that and then we've got something a little bit different stay tuned because in the show i finally meet up with the other tech talks host neil hughes uh, and we're joined as well by sonia barlow at the podcast show. Anyway, Sam Grice before that, really poignant talk about death and how we deal with it and how technology can help and then something a bit different. So today I'm talking to Sam Grice. Sam, you're the founder of Octopus Legacy. Some people might be familiar with Guardian Angel, um, your name before you were recently acquired. I imagine that we will get into that and the particulars in the course of this conversation. But first of all, thank you for taking the time to, to chat to me. Thank you for having me. I'm very looking forward to it, David. So look, first of all, uh, founder, co-founder, always worth double-checking that. No, I am, am single founder, I, uh, single non-technical founder, I think is the phrase of, of me. So I, um, I, I started the journey alone, a single, a single and, and, and um, yeah, that's a very interesting um, uh, way. I, my first startup, I had three, so there was three of us. Um, right. So that, expect, comparing three and, and one is very, it's a very different process. <laughs> so very interesting. So, so let's start with um, who Octopus Legacy are, and then maybe dive into why you felt this was something that you wanted to to found on your own. Yeah, so Octopus Legacy is a, is a company that helps people um, plan for death, so prepare for death, but then also there for, for after loss, so help people support and guidance after that loss period. And, and we are very much looking at the death um, space holistically, so um, consumers are thinking about death um, to be either they're preparing for it or dealing with it, and, and there's a lot of different project uh, products in the space, and we're trying to consolidate that down because the market's quite fragmented. Um, and it originally started, as you said, as Guardian Angel. I was 27 in finance, and nothing to do with um, to death and dying industry, and lost my mother in a car accident, so a very very sudden death. And why sudden matters in that sense is everything's a lot more heightened because you no know, no preparations are in place, and you're not really expecting it. And so I saw um, what an unplanned death can look like. At the time, I didn't really know what that meant. I just knew it was really chaotic and there was stuff to do and we had to contact lots of people. And um, I, I think as an entrepreneur, I, yeah, it was just it, – I'd say nearly one or two days after mum's death, which is, I know sounds very short after a death to be thinking about a business idea, but I was just looking at the whole space and saying, man, it would be amazing if there was a company here I could just reach out to and they could just help with everything. Not, not, not just a lawyer, not just a finance person, not just a funeral director. And there wasn't anything. And so that's when we started, I started the journey um, uh, and, and went down that path, which was, which was, it's been a very fascinating journey over the years. But And look, this might be a really stupid question, but Especially as you've just mentioned, actually, a few of the aspects of of, of people that are involved in the in the immediacy of of a death, and I actually am the son of a vicar, so grew up in a vicarage, and uh, was quite used to taking calls from undertakers uh, as a teenager. Um, so I have some kind of understanding of of, of what goes on and, and the kind of the the process, I suppose. But why do we need tech? I know that you've just said, wouldn't it be great if there was a service, but why? What is it about the process that you kind of think, hang on a minute, a solution here could really improve the process? Because obviously dealing with death and with grief is something that the human race has been doing for millennia. 
Yeah, it's a good question. So I would say that I think tech, tech enabled is the right word for this for this space. I think there's a lot of companies that have tried all sorts of things. So pure tech plays, you don't speak to any humans, or then uh, the traditional models, which are very human centric. So funeral directors, for example, is very much human to human contact. That's what they do. I think there's a there's a middle ground. I think um, without technology, um, things become inefficient. So that means, and, and in this case, it's someone who's dealing with grief and loss. It becomes an inefficient, inefficient process they have to deal with. Um, and also, it's very fragmented. So yes. Um, you know, as, as a vicar's son, you would have been dealing with, with funeral directors. The family would have been dealing with funeral directors. They would have been dealing with lawyers. They would have been dealing with account, account closure. And without a tech platform, it's very manual because you're doing all of them. So I think tech enables you to, to consolidate and make things more efficient. But I, I, I fundamentally believe you should not remove humans from the process. And I think that that's a really key part of what Octopus Legacy is doing human team contact if you're wanting a will and sit down in your home and write your will with someone then we can offer services if you want to do that online at your home on your couch with a coffee or a beer then you can do that as well and i think it's going to consumers with it doesn't matter the mode of delivery we're here to help is a better attitude than saying you have to do it online or you have to do it in our solicitor's office and so i think it's tech enables you to offer all of those services rather than just one and that's the kind of angle we've gone down and look as as we mentioned you, you started this business on your own how many people are, are now part of Octopus Legacy? It's a good question. It's an ever-evolving question. Um, so we're hiring rapidly. I think we're at 30 now, but we have about 30 to 50 job, jobs in the next 12 months coming through. So we're kind of rapidly scaling across a whole range of backgrounds. But yeah, I think yeah. at the moment it's about 30. So, so we've gone from one to 30. Um, so quite a, quite, a big, quite a big jump up. Death is an inevitability. Um, and it's something that we all have to deal with in various different guises at, at certain points in our life. There are certainly sexier topics, and that's not to diminish the importance of, of what we're talking about. And obviously the circumstances that you described with, with, with your mama are, are awful and tragic. But how easy is it to attract people to, to join your business? You say you're, you're rapidly hiring versus something that looks a little bit shiny and, and maybe appears more fun on the surface. So is, is that a challenge? Um, I would say no. I think it's probably probably as a, as a whole potentially. But what we find is that a lot of people that apply for our roles have been directly exposed to death and dying, um, whether that's losing their own parent or 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 a friend or a grandparent or something really really close to them. And that um, and my story. So my, everyone knows my story. My brand is very much around why I'm trying to do this. I'm doing it for the right reasons. And that does attract good talent. And sometimes you can attract people um, that you wouldn't normally find elsewhere because if they're looking, if they're, if they're searching by salary and location, you know, you, you, sure you'll find you'll find talent. But what we find is a lot of people that find our cause and come. Come, come to us and they might even come to us when there's just a, a role not for them on on our website and I, if i if i like them and they've got a really good good skill set and they're really passionate about disrupting the death industry for 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 empathetic reasons not for because it's a big market and let's go after it that that's what we find really passionate um teams so it may be harder to find but when we find them they're super passionate about our cause now I know that you talk about the fact that you know it's it's super important to think about death as a holistic issue. There's there's a lot of different strands to it. There's a lot involved. Not thinking about it as a as a product. Yet at the same time, when you start a found up a, a startup rather, um, product market market fit is often very important. Uh, and kind of zeroing in on on a particular solution to solve is kind of part of what a lot of people preach. How have you managed to balance that kind of that that perspective that this is a holistic issue and it shouldn't be about a product versus what I suspect your investors would say is, well, where, where's your market? Who's your customer? What are you selling to them? Yeah, it's a good question. I think the, the product market fit we've got is around will writing. That's our main product. And and it is one of those services where um, you need, a, if you want a will, um, and everyone should have a will, in my opinion, um, then we offer a service, you, you can do your will. But we believe the will is the start of a conversation. And a lot of companies, that's the end of the conversation, getting you from start to finish, and then that's your will, um, getting it done quick, getting it done cheap. Okay, that's their service. That's their brand. That's what they do. Um, but we believe the will is the start of a conversation, and we and that we, and we're in the start of a journey as a company. We are a startup, so I guess our plan is the more of these conversations we have to open up. Well, you've done your will, but what about everything else that you may have not been thinking of? Um, and and the advantage of of Octopus's strategy, which is which is long term patient investment and, and and plans, then you know we don't have to force them force consumers down a, a conversion funnel very very shortly. Um, obviously, we're a business. So 
we, we make money, but it's more that we could have a 20 year conversation with someone about their legacy and what that means and how they, how they want to be, be thought of when they're, when they're gone. And that will, that will not only be a better product for that consumer, but um, a 10 times better product for their, their children and the people that they leave behind, because that's what we're, we're trying to do as a company. So it's a, a longer horizon helps. So very much a case of, of build something that really satisfies that need around something, say, like a will, and then build loyalty and trust in the fact that you're trying to kind of partner, I suppose, with that person. Yes, and, and what we find with death is, is people, it's very hard to convince someone to plan for death if they don't want to. So if, they, if they're not ready to write their will, or and, and what often happens is that life events are co- cause these, these urgencies. So um, I've just had a, a young child, he's, he's seven weeks old, and um, even if someone in, in the death industry who, who, who works with planning, I knew it was okay, time to redo our wills. And um, it, it becomes a lot harder when you've got another dependent involved, um, mm-hmm. my, 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 my new boy. Um, and so what we find is that people come to us looking for one of our products, whether it's the life insurance product or the power of attorney, power of attorney because their parents may be needing to go into care and they're thinking about it, a will because they've just had children or someone around them has just died. So what we find is they'll come to us um, looking for a specific product and it's important for product market fit reasons, as you said, to, to give them what they want without overcomplicating it with, well, have you thought about this? But then use that as a conversation starter into, well, have you thought about leaving a voice note for your loved ones? Or have you thought about recording yourself in, in case something was to happen? And, and we believe that allows us to, to form that strong relationship rather than trying to just force a product down, uh, down, a, down a funnel, which mm. is, is what a lot of the industry does. Look, we've mentioned Octopus a couple of times. Uh, and we mentioned that you, you started the business as uh, Guardian Angel. So two questions and approach either, you know, which, whichever first makes the most sense, I suppose, when you're telling the story. But why Octopus? And why the word legacy? Yeah, it's a good question. So we were never in, intending to, to sell. We were in the, uh, the typical startup journey. Um, I think the, the phrases have, have got a bit blind over the year. We were probably early Series A or Series A. The, 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 the sages of startup raising has changed rapidly over the years. And we were we were investing. And I met um, Octopus as part of that process. Um, there are, they do a whole bunch of things. That everyone would probably know their energy brand, but they also have an investments holding business. Uh, a big part of that is uh, venture capital, so the, the, one of the largest uh, EIS investors in the country. Um, and so I was speaking to them, and uh, the founder of Octopus, Simon, actually attended one of those calls, which is very unlike um, what he does. And he was asking a lot of questions to me about the customer, um, questions you wouldn't normally expect in a, in a pitch, um, things about what would you do if, if this went wrong for the customer? How would you treat this? And and because he, he, he breathes customer, that's what he, that's what that's who Simon is. And so I thought it was very interesting, but different um, conversation. And then he called me afterwards and, and, and had an open conversation about about joining octopus group becoming an octopus company what that would mean um the the doors that would open but more importantly the capital of doing my vision uh, is quite large and it's quite a quite a lot of products and a lot of range as you said it's quite complicated um and he said that's a it's a great vision but it needs a lot of capital and we can work with you on doing that and um so i would say why octopus was because we weren't looking they came to us um and simon convinced me that i can help more people under his brand banner and his brand and octopus is a loved brand um i be able to help more people get closer to my vision um, with his support and um, I, I believed him and I thought it was the best decision for us and um, I would say it was a tough decision but it was an easy decision at the same time one of those things that is kind of you know it's a big comp- you know it's a big decision but when you hear it you're like that's gonna that's gonna help more people and that's gonna that's gonna get our vision done quicker so that was the octopus part and then we balanced between changing names or not. We didn't have to. And the Guardian Angel name actually comes from when when my mum died, my aunties like swooped in. They helped with a lot of that chaos that I told you about. And um then the funeral and and consequently afterwards, my dad kept referring to them as Guardian Angels through the process. And that's where the name actually stemmed from. I wanted to create a brand that kind of created my aunties, um, re- redid my aunties in a, in a digital, non-digital way, however that was to form. And so we did like the brand and I was very passionate about the brand. Um, but we went through a, a series of, of sessions on the Octopus brand. It's, it's loved by consumers. Um, and would that help us um, become more recognizable? And, and so we went down that decision. So once we become the Octopus, then the legacy part was, was well, what are we actually trying to achieve? And as I mentioned, we think this is more about you know octopus will or octopus um of life insurance and so it was more well, what are what are consumers and what are what is society trying to do 
And what they're trying to do is ensure that the people they leave behind have got some sort of support. And so, you know, your will isn't for you. Your life insurance is not for you. These documents and products will never be used by you because you'll, you'll be dead, unfortunately. But your loved ones will use them. And so that's, we believe, legacy. That's something you've got to leave behind. And if once you go down the legacy route, it gets quite exciting um, because it doesn't just have to be the will. It can be like what, like I said, the, the voice notes and, and videos. I mean, some of the most valuable stuff I've got of my mum is little snippets on, on on my phone or videos of her and to be a brand and a company that enables that whilst to your point it has product market fit and sells something we are we are our company um, i think the balance of that is, is super exciting and i think no one's really tackled the industry with the consumer's hat on which is what i think we're trying to do what um this this might be slightly kind of I, I don't know random question, but I sometimes feel that with with technology recently, and if you kind of have a look at the way that um, shows like Black Mirror are kind of portraying technology and death in science fiction, and and the way that some people are concerned about the development of AI, that almost technology is in is in some way encroaching on the grieving process, delaying it, making you not have to go through it, because all of a sudden you have this kind of this technology answer that keeps an element of the person there in your life and I, I don't necessarily think that that's wholly comfortable or, or or sensible um what you're suggesting there i suppose is keepsakes and treasures but but something a little bit more uh considered and mature around how we use technology to enable um the, the grieving process is this a conversation that comes up in the office or, or, or with your investors or with customers about how we actually approach grief um, with the technology that's now at our fingertips and um, how, how ready do people tend to be to have a conversation like that? Yeah, so I think it's a really good question. Um, my answer might be a bit of a cop-out, but I would say I think it's better for companies not to have too strong an opinion on, on the answer to that question. So what, what I mean there is some people might find – it not appropriate or they don't want to leave voice notes or messages or whatever to the family and they think you know that like you said i'd rather just leave my will and make my finances sorted and that's fine right through to someone who might say um you know i'll create a hologram of me or, or a tweet machine that can tweet from the grave um and i think it's important for, for people to decide what, on what spectrum they are because mm. they might find that really appropriate and if they find that really appropriate maybe their family does as well and is it is it good for society or bad for society i think grieving there's no you know five the pro the process of dealing with losses is very different from from for everyone if you if you take my example um my, me and my sisters have, have had a very different journey um through losing mum largely because this company has been i think like counseling in disguise if you will so I've, I've been dealing with death every day i'm really passionate about it in a weird way it's created positive energy around my mum's death which i know you probably probably shouldn't but it's because she lives on every day with me i talk about it every day like like i'm talking with you i talk about it with my team and and that's really helped me and so if, she, if there was a hologram of her in the office, maybe maybe a bit step too far. But I mean, she is living every day with us, um, and and I think that's helped me a lot. And that might not work for everyone, but I think it's important for for a brand not to have too strong opinions on on that, and let the let the customer drive it within reason, obviously, um, because. Yes, I, I, I mean, I know this company is in the US using AI to, to, to create holograms and, and using speech and and written language from the deceased to, to bring that person back in a little bit. And it, I think it's hard to say whether that is positive or not. I think it's important for consumers to know that obviously their loved one has passed and they need to move on with their life. But you you can you can remember the legacy of your loved one in a lot of different ways. And I think we're, we're going through that digital revolution now ourselves. So we'll see how it goes. So that was a very elegant response to a, to a question, which I think betrays the fact that this is highly emotive, obviously. And I, I, I couldn't help but accidentally put my own opinions into the way that I was phrasing it when I was talking to you. But it does actually, it does present an interesting question. Because yes, you're talking about customers there. But you mentioned at the top of the interview that a lot of people come and join your business because this is an experience that they have had. How has that very emotive aspect of this experience um, shaped the company culture and how do you manage that? Because I imagine as a, as a founder and a leader of the business, that must actually be quite a challenge. Yes, so I think, and I think 
it kind of links to what I that what I was saying is that everyone's grief journey in that team is is different. So we've realized it's not just we don't sit around and oh that happened. Yes, I felt the same way, and yes, it's this is very it's a very much of a spectrum. And so I think um, that does enable um, debate and conversation. But when we're talking about things, it, it is with the. Um, Generally, with the we're a bereavement services company. That's how we view ourselves. So ultimately, we are here for the people that are left behind. So a lot of those discussions are framed around that. So is this appropriate for for the loved ones? And what I would say is a really common theme around all of that is everything I'm talking about today, which is a little different, like voice notes, messages to children. Um, you, you know, you could record a, a a storybook for your grandchildren in case something was to happen to you before they could really you could really read to them. And a lot of those ideas are not getting debated that much because everyone that has lost someone around them has said, well, actually, yeah, if I had that of my mum, that would be amazing. Um, and I think that does give us faith that we're, we've got a bit of a, uh, and, and maybe that's linked to the fact that they joined the business. So they're a little bit disruptive and thinking themselves, but, but, in, and holistically those, those products are fine when it comes to commercialization. That's when a lot of debates happen um, because we want to ensure that we um, we're not seen to be taking advantage of people that are vulnerable, which is a big part of this industry as well. It does sound like your your advice, perhaps to people will be lis- to, to, to people listening, is is to try and have that conversation at the very least, and and be open to having that conversation. I suppose. Yeah, I, I think so, and I think it's losing someone you love. I think I, I there's a lot of debate in the industry around is there a taboo on death? I think I don't think there is. I think what the, well, I guess it depends on the definition of taboo. But what I would say is that. People are worried about having the com- a lot of time having the conversation because it's very emotional. It's 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 hard to sit with someone you love and say you know you might not be here one day or I might not be here one day, um, and and so for that reason we're not having the conversation. But if you sit down with your loved ones and have a conversation, it doesn't have to be morbid about what happens when I die. And that's the problem with the industry. It's, it's focused on assets and wills and to talk about um, you know the first time you you remember them and have have those conversations because if you don't have them. Um, you won't be able to have them. That's the reality of life. And I've got very limited stuff of my mum, but a lot of stuff of my dad now. And because I know that when dad dies, which will happen, um, I've now got videos, uh, voice recordings of him, t- conversations about the first time he met my mum. And, and I've, I've even got a, a thing of him, him and mum having their first kiss, which I know sounds really weird, but it's quite nice to have that story. And I've got that now. My, my, grand, my kids will have that story of their grandparents. And if I hadn't had that conversation, which to be honest, wasn't morbid at all. It was actually a really lovely conversation. And he loved having it i loved listening to it it doesn't need to be about the story is in case when you die it's just humans talking better and and having those keepsakes for when the day does happen which will happen for, for everyone listening to this podcast final question then um as a tech entrepreneur which boil everything strip everything away that is that okay. is what you are you might have started by saying a non-tech founder um but you are a tech entrepreneur what would your advice be you, you've been through this process a couple of times you, you mentioned that you were one of three now you're a so solo founder you've also been successful um in attracting um investment even if it was not something you were necessarily aware was going to happen when that conversation happened what do you think that the ingredients to a successful story are i my advice is always and I know this sounds a bit, a little bit cliche, but make sure what you're going after is, is something you're actually passionate about. I can I can tell you now, it is a, it's a slog. It's startups are not easy, um, and every day is a challenge. And you're going to be all these fires are going to come at you. And as a, as a founder and a founding team, your your job is to solve those problems. That's what why you're here. Nothing's going to go smoothly. Um, people that say it goes smoothly are often are often not telling you about the ninety nine point nine percent of stuff that goes wrong. Um, LinkedIn is a good example of that. They are only sharing good news. You don't often share the bad news. So um, when the days get dark and and it gets hard, you 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 know you you will give up if you're not super passionate about what you're trying to do. And I see a lot of founding teams fall out because someone's very passionate. Someone's like, oh, yeah, I thought it was a great opportunity, but I'm not that interested about the SaaS product that sells recruitment software or, or whatever. Um, and so the the um, the idea is to be super passionate about what you're doing. And, and what I mean, and often that's why you see people from, so if you use the recruitment example, a lot of the best recruitment software platforms are from people from the industry because they're super passionate about it. That's what they do. Um, so I'd say make sure you, you find something you're super passionate about because when the days get tough, it's easy to fall back on the fact that you enjoy coming to work, ultimately solving the problem that you set out to solve rather than just jumping into something because you think it's a great opportunity and can make you a lot of money. I, I'd say I've met a lot of very successful entrepreneurs, ones very a lot more successful than me, 
And none of them really set out with the intention of making lots of money. I think they know it would come if success, if, if you get successful, the money would come um, and the success of the business would come. But ultimately, they've set out to solve something they're passionate about and, and the success has followed. And lastly, if someone is interested in Octopus Legacy um, as a service, how, what's the best way of, of finding out a little bit more about what, what's available? So website, so optimuslegacy.com, um, we explain that. We've got a chat and we've got a phone number. Give our team a call um, uh, or, or send or send me a LinkedIn or, or a message or our team. Um, hello at is our, is our email. Um, and yeah, if anyone, in particular, if anyone's looking to, to join join the journey um, and, and are super passionate about our course, then um, we've got a lot of roles open at the moment for a whole bunch of jobs. So um, so they can come to us as well. But um, yeah, optimuslegacy.com is a good place to start. And that covers off our full range of services as well. Cool. Well, look, thank you very much for your time today. Uh, seven weeks into um, a newborn, uh, you've got a lot on your plate aside from running a business. So taking time to jump on a podcast is greatly appreciated. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you so much, David. As I mentioned, I met with Neil Hughes at the podcast show. I was kindly invited by Sonia Barlow, who was talking on the brand stage uh, earlier this week. Podcast show very well attended, Spotify, um, BBC Sounds there, some celebrities, you know, talking about the industry, the podcasting industry itself. Um, and Neil had mentioned that he was going to be there. You might remember Neil's been on the show before. He's a journalist. He is the host of the Tech Talks Daily, which is in the top 0.5% of podcasts globally. He um, produces episodes seven days a week, which is truly staggering. Um, I know how much it takes to put three episodes out a week um but a really exceptional podcast one you should check out and obviously sonia we know uh, she's been on the show many times host of the sonia barlow show and a very good event uh compare moderator and host we sat down at a table got the nomono sound capsule out and decided to capture a bit of conversation whilst we were there right in the middle of the show floor with loads going on hence the background but i hope it's an interesting uh chat and if you're a content creator plenty here from neil that uh, I think is is very actionable. Next week, um, slight different tone. Uh, we're going to bring you five episodes. We are going to go Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and that's because we've got loads of good content that we've been wanting to share for a few weeks now from Web Summit Rio. So the interviews will all be from Rio, starting with RGA, uh, an American firm that we met uh on the first night that I was there. So that's next week. Some really great interviews throughout the course of that week, but I'll pass you back to our time at the podcast show. There we go. Right, so this is entirely impromptu. Okay. I have grabbed Neil from the Tech Talks Daily Show, <laughs> which is the bigger version of Tech Talks. No, 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 I wouldn't say that at all. We've both been in the game the same amount of time. <laughs> And we're not going to argue over 0.5%, are we? Well, you know. <laughs> I wouldn't mind that debate, actually. <laughs> I think you should fight it out right now. Hello, Sonia. How are you all doing? Yeah, look, we're all sat at the, um, at the podcast show. I thought this would be quite funny to record right in the middle of the show floor and see how it comes out. I think it will come out perfectly for our yeah. show on Friday. Um, but as we're here, anything catching your eye? Too many celebrities. Too I don't, many celebrities. I, I don't know if we're uh, slightly burned by all this, but we're all indie podcasters that have been in the game for nine years, and suddenly we're getting, I don't know, celebrities everywhere with yeah. five episodes that are just kind of dominating all the conversations. And Yeah, I kind of... I do get a little bit like... I like Thick Hope. She's a great broadcaster, right? Yes. But I walked over to a stand just there, and she's the face of like three or four different podcasts, it seems, all of a sudden. Yeah, yeah, And yeah. it's like, that's great, but what room does that then leave for new faces? Or is that really just a silly view and that podcasting's huge, it's still growing, and of course there's room for up-and-coming new independent podcasters? Yeah, I like to think there is, but I mean, I just went to see James Corden a few moments ago. Yeah, yeah. We were talking about with Sirius. First of all, I was sat in the first five rows and I got moved from my seat because I didn't have the right badge and they asked me to sit at the back. Did you, you should have said, <laughs> do you know who I am? <laughs> so I, I, because I've only got a gold badge, only a gold badge, they put me at the back. So I went uh, a, a little wild. bit further the back, which didn't go down too well. Uh, but then the whole conversation was about locking their podcasts behind paywalls. They must have video so they can travel. 
But equally, the podcaster we're talking about, James Cordens, is only available in the US at the moment. So, oh. And I think one of the things I see again and again is people overcomplicate podcasts. Yep. For you and I, we sit down, we hit record, have a conversation, push it out. Yes. And here is all about just overcomplicating it. From yes. And I think that's a really great point you bring. Like when I first met David, I was really keen to start a podcast, but super nervous. And I remember he came on the first ever podcast I did. He was like, just, just do it. Yes. Edit it, figure it out as you went along. And then I was 10 episodes in, I got a book, I got the BBC, I let it go. And then I started again in January. In January, to talk about overcomplicating, I thought I needed this big fancy studio with lights, with all the tech, not knowing not only how much does it cost, but it's not an authentic conversation. So in yeah. 2024, I've gone back to Instagram Lives, taking that audio, editing it and putting on podcasts and it works just as well. Yeah. So it's about quality, consistency in the content versus, you know, who's the face of it or how many followers does this human being have? Because I don't think that converts into yeah, actual yeah. listeners and subscribers. And also, with all due respect, a celeb can't talk about every subject matter because it's not their niche. And yeah. so you need real people on the ground who can actually talk about what needs to be spoken about because they have the information behind it. Yeah, yeah. 100%. I was having a conversation a few moments ago about somebody who was in, with a company that were managing influencers from a certain reality show. And they said they had 2 million followers on Instagram, but actually those figures didn't convert to their podcast. They'd done six episodes and only had a handful of listeners a month. So You should tell them who you were. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting though, isn't it? Because there is so much smoke and mirrors. The talk before, the one that you moderated, Sonia, they were talking about which metrics to pay attention to. And if I'm perfectly honest, I ignore most of the metrics. I only really look at, well, for a start, the show is now hosted on Spotify for podcasters. Yeah which then means that really it's only about 20% of our audience I'm getting really accurate data on. So I just look at the number of subscribers we've got, and as long as that is trending up, yeah. then it's kind of like, okay, fine. And I think the big focus on downloads, it's not downloads, it's people. We're almost dehumanizing yeah, yeah, yeah. people. They're, they're listeners, aren't they? You know? Yeah, so. and as long as new people are finding your podcast and they're enjoying it, that's all that really matters. Yeah, I think being, being a part of somebody's routine, showing up the same time every yeah. day, it's not about getting a $500 microphone when your guest has got some old Apple earphones and, yeah, yeah. and they're yeah. using that. But I would say the other thing that people miss out on is when you started and how long you've been going for. So if I started as an example in Jan 2023 and we reach 100,000 people a month, we have 40,000 subscribers, you have to think about that relative time, the consistency, the content, yeah. the kind of people you're then able to target versus someone who's had social media for 10 years and is now reaching X amount or Y amount. Or to your point, the followers they have, because those followers are following their accounts for a different reason. They're not necessarily listening to what they have to say, you know? Yeah. And I also think that it's interesting because the panel I hosted was all about brand marketing and CPM and, and engagement. But then when you're talking to brands and PRs about why someone should be on your podcast, a lot of the time you have to so justify yourself and they're like, who else has been on it? Where's it going to be hosted? How many you know likes does it get? What's, which, which given what's they approach the you in the first place, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. it's so interesting. You're like, but you know, because you came to me and you like the content. Yes, but it doesn't have the likes on Instagram. No, that's because when people are listening to podcasts, they are listening. Yes. They people who are listening, with all due respect, even if they're watching on YouTube, it's very unlikely they're going to go like something they're listening to, right? Yeah. They oh, just yeah, I listen. listen to it. I normally listen when I run. Yeah. Yes. Or in the car. So like the approach is very different. The strategy yeah, yeah, yeah. is very different and your audience is very different. My audience are probably CEOs of founders or people with disposable income or individuals that are time poor but they want to learn from other, yeah. you know, business leaders. Yeah. They are not liking yes. stuff. They are listening. Before I wrap this up, because I'm slightly conscious that we'll probably get told that we should have got some license to record in the middle of the podcast show. Um, Do you think so though? Isn't that the no, whole I don't point know. of being here? <laughs> probably needs some proper access. Um, Neil, what's coming up on Tech Talks daily? Oh man, so I've got two big events coming up. I've got the Sphere event in Helsinki next week. And then um, I've got five or six interviews uh, with Cisco in Vegas. And wow. Very nice. And widespread as well. Although it's not just about Cisco, it's that we've got Virgin and a whole heap of big names. I can't remember, I'm gonna be completely honest with you. So I think I've got 60 interviews booked in between now and August. And I only deal with what's right in front of me now. 
I may I ask, do you record, edit, produce yourself? Everything's myself. So with, I think with, that's with, amazing. With the help of AI as well now, of course. And what AI tools are you using? So I use Fathom AI that I attach to Zoom, and that gives like a, a summary of everything that we talked about. Uh, and I also use something called Descript. If I've got one, an individual... I'm a, I'm a squadcaster, so Descript is... Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. Only for filler words. My, my criticism of it, it gets too... Uh, it will remove everything and the conversation doesn't flow, it doesn't sound natural. Yeah, yeah. But if you do have a particular person that's, that says you know 300 times, it will just get rid of it. So that's, that's one of my favourites. And of course, ChatGPT I use it. But what I find really easy is when I'm thinking up questions to ask my guests, because I'm recording 10 a week, I get all the PR blurb and everything that I get and put all that into uh, ChatGPT along with their bio. And I've got a custom GPT about me and say, bear in mind, you know who I am and what I do. What would the audience like me to ask this person? Oh, wow. So then, smart. I'm taking uh, notes, actually, uh, right and now. It's, it's not perfect, but it gives me a, a much quicker starting point that I can work from and tweak. You know what? You probably have learned as much about podcasting as you need to know that you're going to learn anywhere on this floor in the last 90, 90 no, I was seconds or so. Say, this so. has been invaluable for me, who is <laughs> a relatively new podcaster looking to play the long game and not the overnight viral sensation there you go. content. Right, I'm going to wrap this up because uh, from my point of view, although we're recording in the middle of the week, it's now Friday when this is going out. And next week, we've got five episodes from Rio de Janeiro that were recorded back at Web Summit Rio. Wow, so we're actually fancy. publishing daily next week as a one-off to get fancy. through the content. Wow. But not Saturday and Sunday. I think the fact that we've met at the same location, recording a podcast, and you're going daily, it's, it feels like Ghostbusters crossing the streams almost. <laughs> it's only for one week. <laughs> I can't do more than one week. Anyway, Rio next week. <laughs> Tech Talks is hosted and edited by David Savage. It is produced by Nash Squared. And we have special thanks to Lemzy for supplying music to this show. <laughs>